Coming up on Market to Market. The Obama administration ramps up its efforts to fight climate change. The Energy Department predicts prices at the pump will fall this summer to the lowest level in years. And we'll catch up with the trio of Kansas brothers whose agricultural video clips have been viewed by millions. What goes down on the farm in a typical day? Those stories and market analysis with Tom Fitzenmeyer next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, April 10 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. While U.S. shoppers loosened their purse springs a bit last winter, they appear to have racked up a record amount of debt. According to the Commerce Department, consumer spending increased slightly in February. But a separate report from the Federal Reserve this week revealed that consumer credit ballooned that month to an all-time high of $3.3 trillion. Auto financing and student loans rose more than 8% to a combined $19.2 billion. That's their largest monthly gain in nearly four years. And it more than offset a $3.7 billion decline in credit card debt. Consumers have been more reluctant to charge their purchases since the Great Recession. But many economists believe lower unemployment will have Americans whipping out the plastic more frequently in the months ahead. And with the U.S. economy improving steadily, the Obama administration is setting its sights on other agendas. This week, after medical experts reported on growing health threats due to climate change, the president announced expanded efforts to cope with a warming planet. By expanding its Climate Data Initiative, launched last year to include more than 150 health-relevant data sets, the Obama administration aims to inform communities nationwide on how to prepare for the health ramifications of a warmer, more erratic climate. The White House cited a recent study by the American Thoracic Society in which 77% of its members claim to have witnessed, quote, increased chronic disease severity from air pollution. The president's team also announced that a group of 30 medical institutions, including Harvard, Johns Hopkins, the University of Maryland, and the University of Nebraska, have pledged to instruct students how to address the health impacts of climate change. What we know is that uh, the temperature of the planet is rising. Uh, and we know that in addition to the adverse impacts that may have uh, when it comes to more frequent hurricanes uh, or more powerful storms uh, or increased flooding, uh, we also know that it has an impact on uh, public health. We know that if there are more wildfires, a consequence of uh, rising temperatures, that there are going to be more particulates in the air. We know that potentially uh, it extends uh, the allergy season uh, and can induce uh, greater uh, incidents of asthma or more severe incidents of asthma. Speaking at Howard University Medical School, the president announced commitments from several private sector firms to formulate solutions to health issues it claims are being exacerbated by environmental shifts. The Centers for Disease Control also see a correlation between climate change, globalization, and an increase in bacterial and viral diseases transmitted by mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas. In response, Microsoft is launching a pilot program to monitor mosquito populations in order to predict potential disease outbreaks caused by the airborne pests. And according to the American Lung Association, studies have found warmer temperatures increase the formation of ozone, a chief component of smog. Skeptics, however, cite Environmental Protection Agency data revealing smog levels have actually declined more than 30% since 1980. The naysayers also claim that shrouding highly contested aspects of executive action on climate change in the guise of public health is a covert tactic to push the president's agenda. The bottom line is we all need to do our part. Uh, obviously, this administration's been aggressive in using the uh, administrative authorities that we 
currently have to uh, increase fuel efficiency standards to make sure that uh, we are taking uh, more carbon out of the emissions from our power plants. Uh, but we've got a lot more work to do uh, if we're going to deal with this problem in an effective way and make sure that our families and our kids are safe. The Environmental Protection Agency announced Friday that it has settled a lawsuit with the petroleum industry and agreed to establish long overdue ethanol blending mandates for 2014 and 2015. Initial drafts of the biofuel targets will be proposed by June 1st, and then the final quotas will be announced by the end of November. The ethanol industry touts its fuel's ability to reduce gasoline prices. And in a, in a development credited more to the boom in domestic oil production, the Energy Department predicted this week that prices at the pump will plunge this summer. With the peak driving season about to get in gear, the Energy Department predicts U.S. motorists will pay the lowest summertime fuel costs in nearly six years. According to the government, gasoline prices will average $2.45 per gallon from April through September, down 32% from last year. While drivers are expected to consume slightly more gas this summer, the Energy Department estimates that the average U.S. household will spend about $700 less on gasoline in 2015, and annual fuel expenditures will fall to their lowest level in 11 years. Lower prices at the pump are due primarily to the boom in North American oil production. And that in turn is prompting significant changes in the industry itself. Royal Dutch Shell announced this week that it will buy British rival BG Group for $69.7 billion. The deal could signal that the energy sector is beginning to consolidate due to lower oil prices. Shell faced opposition on the environmental front this week as well. When Greenpeace activists boarded one of its drilling rigs headed for the Alaskan waters, it leases from Uncle Sam. Despite the fact that the U.S. government itself admits that there's a 75% chance of an oil spill should oil production begin in the Chukchi Sea, the Obama administration has still given the first green light to Shell along the way to Arctic oil drilling. But this is not the final step in the process. Shell has not received its final oil drilling license yet. While some environmental activists criticized the Obama administration for approving expanded oil production in the Arctic, the president has actually decreased the amount of drilling in the U.S. Arctic Wildlife Refuge and charged the Environmental Protection Agency with helping the nation cut carbon emissions by 30 percent over the next 15 years. Two years ago, Market to Market introduced viewers to the Petersons, a trio of brothers from Kansas whose musical parodies became an internet sensation almost overnight. Since we first aired the story, the Peterson brothers have expanded their sphere of influence from a small community on the Southern Plains to a global stage. And what began as a whimsical video extolling the virtues of agriculture has exploded into a series of clips viewed more than 35 million times on YouTube. Paul Yeager explains. Deep in the heart of waving wheat, the Peterson family farm is a working soundstage. This 1,000 acre operation has served as a real life studio for the Peterson brothers breakout hit I'm farming and I grow it. The video went viral and now has amassed 9 million views. It launched a farm music career of Greg, Nathan, and Kendall Peterson of Asaria, Kansas. It's just crazy to think about um, people are, for some reason, clicking on our video out there. The trio has taken a handful of pop hits and made them their own. Now this is a story all about how Our life is spent wiping sweat off our brow And we'd like to take a minute just to stop and say What goes down on the farm in a typical day? Working farmer style Farmer style Work, 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 work Working farmer style I am a farmer And they want to see me show oh, 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 oh. All I do is farm, 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 no matter what. Market to Market first discovered the Petersons' agrotainment efforts in 2012. In the years since, a few things have changed. Greg is now a college graduate. Middle brother Nathan is a junior at K-State, 
and is now joined by Kendall in Manhattan. The family farm still requires a full-time commitment, and the brothers say their lives have changed, but their values are still the same. We're still just normal people, uh, still working on a normal farm with everyday troubles and everyday good things. When I meet people, I just like to think, well, they're not too much different from me, and I'm not too much different from them, and uh, we're all working together to feed the world and, and just each do our jobs. So uh, it's just kind of cool how it all works together. We are the Peterson Farm Bros. Despite that humble attitude, the video clips have given the brothers other opportunities. I've always had an idea of the potential of what we're doing, um, but it continues to surprise me each and every day. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've gone and told our story to, to groups all over the country, and every time I tell the story, it, it still blows my mind, you know, just, talk, just, just reliving that, those first two weeks and the time since. At the time of the release of their first video, Greg was a senior studying ag communications at Kansas State University. At times, his classes would turn into discussions about, well, the Peterson brothers and how they took the everyday happenings in rural America and made them known around the world. The class would then hear how an idea conceived in a Manhattan, Kansas drive-in restaurant landed the family in the center of Manhattan, New York. The Petersons then became a hot commodity on the speaking circuit. Greg said he could fit some appearances around his studies, but eventually he would have requests to appear during classes. But when he explained his predicament to his instructors, they were supportive of his newfound stardom. And the professors would almost encourage it uh, just because of the positive things we were doing. And... and the opportunities took Greg and at times the entire family all around the world. The family estimates it's done 75 events across 30 states in four foreign countries. The most recent trip was to Australia. The Petersons say they are trying to live normal lives, but the mission remains the same raising awareness of agriculture's positive contributions to life in the information age. Do you consider yourself an advocate? Yeah, I think that's, I think by definition, that's, that's kind of my job. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on the farm. I'm basically, yeah, promoting what I, what I believe about agriculture and, and uh, just doing it in a fun and entertaining way. There's nothing to this video, however, by the restaurant chain Chipotle got the attention of Greg. He said the chain Scarecrow campaign, aimed at changing the way people think about and eat fast food, made him mad because it distorted the reality of conventional farming. And when Chipotle later released a web TV series called Farmed and Dangerous, Greg submitted this statement to the Huffington Post, quote, the truth is that they are attacking thousands of family farms across America like ours, that fit the definition of an industrial farm. I was just frustrated with Chipotle and how they went about it, and I actually tweeted back and forth with their media, with their media public relations guy, and, and um, I don't know, they're, they're not interested in, in talking to farmers. They're interested in, in you know, promoting themselves and, and making people buy more of their stuff. It's not about farmers, it's, it's about uh, money. Despite his battle with a well-heeled restaurant chain, Greg says his job is far from over. One of my main goals in life is to, is to correct um, mistruths, you know, false information, whether it's about farming, uh, whether it's about, you know, like my faith, uh, just anything I'm passionate about. If people are out there and, and they're promoting things about it that aren't true, um, that, that's what really sparks my, my passion to, to help correct that. And so um, I, just, I just want to be someone who stands for truth. And, uh, you know, you talk about Chipotle claiming that they want to have integrity. Well, that, that's kind of what I want to, to bring about is, is integrity. And I think, I think farmers have a lot of integrity. While Greg has turned the viral video into a successful career on the speaking circuit, he and younger brother Nathan are never totally removed from the farm. Farming is what we're used to, so you can kind of go back there. And, and uh, even when I get tired of classes at school and stuff, I can still come home and work on the farm a couple days, and you can come back here and just kind of relax. Agriculture is so important. As long as we can paint a positive 
a picture for agriculture uh, in whatever way that is. You know, maybe our videos will change a little here and there, but um, we have a platform, and so we're trying to do our best with it. We pull out of the yard about seven or eight, and we yell to the cattle, you'll see us, smell you later. As far as the next couple of years go, we're, we're hoping to continue to make videos, and, and uh, I think Nathan said it, as, as long as our videos stay quality and as long as we're having, you know, fun making them, uh, we don't want to get to the point where it's, it's considered a chore to make these videos. They're just as fun for us to make as, as they are for people to watch. We still love the farm, farm, farm. And if you know the charm, put your hands in the air, make them stay there. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain prices retreated this week as the trade pondered the impact of a resurgent dollar and weather forecasts of timely rains for the Corn Belt. For the week, May wheat lost 10 cents in a move that was virtually matched by the nearby corn contract. Soybeans gave back all of last week's gain and then some as the May contract declined by 35 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with a downward move of more than $18 per ton. In the softs, cotton extended its winning streak as the May contract gained $1.37 per hundredweight. Dairy prices also improved modestly as the May Class 3 milk contract rose by 18 cents. Big price moves this week in the livestock sector, where the June cattle contract lost nearly $4.57. Nearby feeders plunged nearly $7.75, and the June lean hog contract gained $3.42. In the currency market, the U.S. dollar index flexed its muscle again with a gain of nearly 2%. Crude oil rose $2.50 per barrel. Comex Gold advanced by $3.70 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained more than 10 points to settle at 413 even. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Tom Pitzenmeyer. Tom, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. Let's jump right into this wheat market. Uh, we saw a slightly favorable report on Tuesday, and uh, the market didn't seem much to care. Talk us through what happened. Well, the U.S. isn't selling all that much wheat, though. All the wheat demand's go going elsewhere. Um, they were, they were kind of excited about the fact that we had got some dry conditions in the western plains. Kansas, that, that we had that first crop condition rating came in a little on the disappointing side. Um, so you got that supply side support coming in. Um, on the other hand, d demand's not very good. So I, I suspect you're going to see wheat in a trading range from with really strong support at 480 and pretty tough resistance up about 15 cents or so from where we closed Friday at 540. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're inclined to want to sell wheat up against that 540 would be the place to do it, I think. Looking out over the short term, next two, three weeks, any chance to on the demand side to really push us closer to that 540 or do, do you pull the trigger if you need cash at 530? Um, yeah, there's a chance of it. I, this dollar strength isn't help, helping, going to help any either, although, you know, we had a pretty nice move up this week, so a little consolidation wouldn't be a big surprise next week. Um, uh, technically, it looks a little better, uh, the way, and the way we closed Friday maybe looked a little better, so, yeah, I'd, pr I'd probably fade the, the 540 and start maybe at 530, but somewhere up in that range. All right. Now, jumping down into the corn contracts, we saw that uh, the report, they added 50 million bushels to the U.S. carryout. Uh, was that the, the main driver of this down week in the corn market? Yeah, I think I think that. And again, once again, the, the dollar's stronger. Um, you've got a lot of competition around the wor world for Ukraine selling corn. Uh, at, at somewhat less than what the U.S. Gulf price is. They've got almost 3 million metric ton more this year than they had a year ago at this time to sell. Argentina ha had a good crop. They're, they're selling corn cheaper. Uh, the Safrina crop in Brazil is, is on track to be pretty good. They tend to export that. So that's going to come in this summer. So th there's some problems on the export side. And, and a lot of people think that there's still adjustments to be made uh, on that stocks number uh, that, that maybe the USDA is still 100 million or so low. Um, uh, and, and then add on top of that, you know, the dry Western Corn Belt is a little dry and got some rain, so that sort of takes the need for that weather premium out of the price. Uh, so some just a bunch of little things, I think, kind of pressured pressured the corn market. I, again, I think it's much like wheat in a trading range. We're probably going to check out the lower end of the trading range here fairly soon, and then 
see, you know, see how planning progresses. Okay, well, now that leads us right into our, our Twitter question. Matt in Northeast Michigan uh, sent us a question on Twitter. We encourage all of our viewers to do that. If you're on Twitter or Facebook, you can find us there 24-7. And uh, Matt's question was, a local dairy wants to lock in corn now for fall harvest from him. He's the seller. What's my best move to protect the upside? Any suggestions for Matt out there in Michigan? Well, I, I, if, if, if you think that upside protection is necessary, I guess I'd probably use a call option of some sort. You can, you know, it depends, you can go out and buy a December call, which costs quite a bit of money. You can use those short dated options. Uh, the September expires late August. Uh, that might be something to look at because we're probably going to know by late August whether we've got a crop or not. So I, I guess I'd be inclined to go with the September short dated call, uh, spend a few cents, and, and protect, protect that upside. All right. Well, let's jump down into the soybean market. 34 and a half cents off this week in old crop beans. Whew, any more room to the upside on this thing? Oh, there's always room for the upside. When everything, anything gets gets oversold, it can. I mean, you can put sixty cents on beans for no good reason. But um, I, having said that, I, I really think Jul July beans are going to have a tough time getting much. I mean, you could test ten dollars, maybe get a little above it. Uh, I don't think No's going to has much chance of going above nine eighty or so. It may, maybe nine eighty five, unless we, unless they're really off on their acreage numbers, or if we have some ma major weather problem. But We've got an El Nino d developing here. If, if that actually happens, we, we, we don't we tend to have under trend line yields if that's the case. Trend line yields in the beans are, we're, we're going to drive believing prices substantially lower. So this might be, even if we're not at that 985, maybe if you need to take some risk off the table, 950 is not a terrible place to make some sales. Right. All right. Well, now let's jump into the livestock markets. We did see a big downward move this week in the live cattle market. Talk to us about what happened there. Anything fundamental? Well, we saw moves up too so, uh, recently. So I mean, I, I think it's just this was just taking some of that away. You, you've got a problem here in this cattle market in that numbers are low, which we've been talking about for two years now. They're, they're having a heck of a time buy, buying cattle. Now you're starting to see a few few heifers being pulled out, which sort of a adds to the tightness. On the other hand. Do we how, do we are really going to function with cattle 100 bucks higher than hogs? Really? How long is that going to last? I, I I just don't think it is. Poultry prices are low. Um, I, 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 exports not good because of strength in the dollar. We're importing cattle. None of that is good for the cattle market. And not, the cash market's held up because of these numbers. But I, I don't know. And, and, you know, everybody's all excited. Or whatever. We're going to all charge out and, and roast ham put hamburgers on the grill, and that's going to save the cattle industry. And I'm not, I, you know, there's some people that don't think a chicken breast or a pork chop's all that bad. So I, I, I guess I'm... Uh, I'm not real surprised to see the break we saw in the market on Friday. So would you at this point be looking to make some longer dated sales, sell out uh, through fall and winter knowing that we are $100 over pork? Absolutely I would. Right. I, I mean, we're, we're, we're at lofty levels. I had a guy call me one time when corn was 8 bucks. He said, think I'm being greedy not selling corn at 8 bucks? I was like, well, probably. Well, cattle at 170 probably is you're getting up there too. Time to make some sales. Yeah. All right. Well, now let's jump into the feeder cattle market. We saw that jump up two weeks ago in feeders. This week gave back seven and three quarters. Same story there, just a little over exuberant. Yeah, pr probably in the same. Uh, if you're going to have a downtrend in corn market, that, that's going to tend to be supportive of the feeder market. Springtime, everybody wants to buy some feeders to put out on pasture. Um, if, if, the, if the cash cattle market holds up, you, you know the optimism. Well, you're a cattleman. You know how optimistic cattlemen are. So um, I, I would suspect the feeder market is going to be supported a little better than the fat market probably. Right, I'm waiting for 300 on the feeders. Is that there fair? You go. No, it's uh, <laughs> not greedy at all. <laughs> uh, now, now, that being said, we have seen some pretty steep diversions between the cash and the board this whole springtime in the cattle market. Yeah. Do you think that's going to converge here and we'll see a little bit closer to historical trading ranges spring and summer? I yeah, well, the April's going to have to. Somehow that's going to have to get reconciled here in the next 20 days. Uh, and, and then it's going to be really interesting to see if we pop right back out and have June, at a, you know, cash at a big problem premium to the June because the June market is having a tough time getting up even in that 155 range. Uh, so there's quite a bit of disparity there. Something's going to have to get corrected. Um, 
as to we bring those the two together. Yeah. Well, now let's jump down into the hog markets. You mentioned that almost a hundred dollar difference in the prices. Uh, any chance that high beef could pull pork higher? Or do you see pork as the anchor in this? Well, market? I think I think pork is being that the retailers using using the big margins they've got in pork to sort of be able to keep keep beef moving through through their their retail outlets. But having said that, I, I, there's some upside potential in the summer months. Uh, you know, maybe up in the 82, 84 range at the most on those summer hog, hog uh, contracts. If they got up to that level, I'd certainly be a seller because I think the the trend is going to be down on, on pork and you need to use those rallies to make sales. Because we're still looking at larger herd size, weights are still very, very high, and none of that seems to yeah. be changing, especially with a $18 lower on the week soybean meal. Yeah, and I hate to harp on it, but again, the dollar isn't helping exports in the, on, on the pork side either. Thoughts so, on the dollar here as we look towards next week? I think that the dollar is going to continue to, to work higher, probably not at the rate it has been. You, you've got this sort of d divergence where the several of the FOMC may, members have said that they think that rates need to be increased. At the same time, uh, Janet Yellen said not that long ago that she's going by data point. They're going by data points, and the data points haven't been all that gr haven't all been all that rosy lately. Um, now some are blaming that on the weather and, and, I, and expecting revisions in some of those, so I think we'll have to wait and see. But as we sit today, the dollar's in a solid uptrend. That tends to last quite a while. I don't know about next week. You could correct a little bit, but probably going to continue to work higher. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us this week, Tom. Right. Thanks, Mike. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Tom and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts as well as streaming video of our program exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll examine an innovative greenhouse in Oklahoma that delivers the goods year round. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.